Thanks for tuning into our podcast. I refuse to say the name out loud. This is Dion. And this is Anniki. Our podcast is two degenerate furries who happen to live together, turning their normal rants and trailing off into a premiere listening experience about design. Content! For the masses. <laughs> <laughs> Prepare for some spicy hot takes and some absolutely Antarctic ones. We hope you enjoy our general sense of laxness and crust. We're doing this all pretty much spur of the moment and there's gonna be some mess. Some mess. A lot of mess. <laughs> Episode 2. This one, Angie at Nintendo. Big Angies. Well, I don't want to like go full hard, like real talk. Most people who've played games have had an experience with Nintendo. And Nintendo experiences are generally not all bad, I would say, for sure. I well, have... I mean, yeah. I The thing that I want to address the most in this episode is that every other game company gets the absolute crap ripped out of them when they do things that are definitely bad for the consumer or for creativity or whatever. And Nintendo gets a pass because it's seen as this like holy grail standard of what you can do when you make a video game. And I just, I want to address that Nintendo isn't perfect. Yeah. And they aren't immune to criticism. One thing that kind of bugs me is like, they have so many crazy ass, like good minds there. They've got so many people making like really interesting concepts and fun games. I think the like focus of fun as a general thing, a general goal <laughs> for them works out pretty well. But there's someone in there, someone making the decisions that like does not have the same mindset. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know if it's like a general like taboo for Nintendo staff in general to just be like, we can never look at a different video game that doesn't come from us. We cannot be influenced by outside sources. And I think only recently have they started listening to people kind of younger in Nintendo. Yeah, I think one thing that's definitely helped games improve in general lately has been all the people who are raised with games are now making them. And it's like, you know, there, there's a younger touch there that has a general idea of what a consumer would want while also having that creative burning passion. <laughs> yes, it's definitely something to be said that people who now make stuff like Legend of Zelda were people who grew up playing Legend of Zelda. I don't know if that gets to the creator's heads a bit, sitting in the same office as someone who you practically raised on your video game. I'm gonna be real, I think that would get to my head a little bit. I think I'd be like, I think I'd be eating it up a little bit. <laughs> oh yes, you, you loved my thing as a child? Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I also have to wonder, like, what amount of, yes, sir, anything you say, sir, goes on because these people, like, revere oh those developers so much. That pressure at Nintendo, I would not want to be a, <laughs> a new hire at Nintendo, I don't think. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't even want to be in the same room as Miyamoto. Like, look, all respect to the dude, but, like, holy shit, being in the same room as Miyamoto has got to be, like... It's scary. <laughs> yeah. Frightening. <sighs> the absolute pressure that I would feel just like, this man made games. <laughs> <laughs> this man made games. Like, games would not be nearly the same thing that they are without this singular man. <laughs> Very true. And, and it's not to take away any, what you am know, I trying to say? No efforts other than his are like... Like, he's not, like, god of games or anything. But as for, like, a single person that has done things that have influenced the entire medium, he's definitely done a lot. <laughs> yeah, I think also Satoru Iwata. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's just to get this preface over with. 
Yes. Everybody who works at Nintendo, I have a lot of respect for. Everybody who I grew up playing the video games of, that doesn't mean, however, that they are completely perfect game designers or human beings or whatever, and we should still at least have the conversation that they are not perfect. And here's what could be done to improve these series, these franchises, etc. Yeah, I definitely didn't want to hop into it as if I was like some Nintendo hater. But now that we've got that out of the way, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> I think my most immediate beef is their online service. Like I mentioned at the end of the episode, how, how in 2020 does the Switch look like it does as far as the UI, which is functional? But how the fuck is the eShop like that? You can't find anything half the time. And all the junk is just forced to the front, and then Nintendo only moderates it when they get complaints about it or something is like infamously milking it. I honestly don't have enough experience with the eShop itself, but because I've played on a Microsoft system, I've played on an Xbox, and I've played on a PlayStation, I haven't played on the Xbox One at all, period, so I don't know what their current store looks like. But back in the 360 days, and especially towards the end of the 360, you knew where the trash specifically specifically was because everything was sorted very very well so you knew if you go down one specific corridor you're gonna end up in trash alley or all of the fucking garbage is yeah and i guess it doesn't really help that switch online or the eShop being open to a lot more developers than, than nintendo has ever let in before i would say <laughs> at least recently it sure as hell is letting in a lot of janky ass quote unquote indie developers because i say that quote unquote because they're making junk to make money rather than you know making games because they like to <laughs> yeah anybody can make junk uh it doesn't matter if it's a movie it doesn't matter if it's a youtube video i'd say mocking myself <laughs> uh it doesn't matter if it's you know a podcast <laughs> anybody can make crap it, it's just the amount of time you're willing to put into it. So to see stuff like that end up on the Nintendo eShop like it was in the 360 era, the late 360 era, when they just let anybody fucking upload a game, how Steam is right now. I will give <laughs> the slightest bit of credit to Nintendo's moderation. It doesn't quite look like Steam, at least. <laughs> yeah. I still think Steam is at least sorted and categorized. Yeah. So you can find the stuff that you want to find. There's a lot of bad recommendations or whatever, but I won't get into that. What I do like to see is that they are letting anybody put up a thing. So it is really easy for indie developers who otherwise would have a hard time. Maybe it's one person, two people, a team of seven, who knows, making some game they really are passionate about. It can get to people, but it also can't because there's no way to find it on purpose. <laughs> Double-edged sword there. You need to sharpen one edge of it. Yeah. Uh, speaking of Nintendo Online, I understand Nintendo's fear of letting kids have a super easy access to an online gaming experience because fucking Christ. <laughs> Yeah, go on any social media and tell me that kids are safe on there. It's, they're not. But that's the same stuff that any other company and any other console has to worry about. I hate friend code. I hate that shit. <laughs> yeah. I am so glad I linked my Twitter to my uh, Switch account because half the people I would have wanted to add have already s sent a friend request or I can find them through Twitter. I would not message somebody in 2020 with like a, I don't know how many, 15 digit code. I can't remember. Yeah. I, any number code honestly unless it was like maybe four digits <laughs> more than four i'm not putting the effort in <laughs> usernames are not something nintendo should shy away from and a permanent online profile is not something nintendo should shy away from i guarantee you they do that already anyway and just don't tell people like every other corporation does yeah and there's a reason that nintendo's online services are archived somewhere even though there are children who said really whacked up things and we have proof of that <laughs> i know we've had this conversation before specifically about nintendo's 
innovation. It's wild to me that Nintendo can be like so adamant on in innovating, but so incredibly like opposed to looking at what everyone else is doing to innovate in order to innovate. <laughs> Yeah, when when you innovate for the sake of innovation off of what only you are doing, you're not innovating. You are covering your ears and shouting la 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 la, mine's better. It's debatable. It's <laughs> it's not always going to be better. I said this on Twitter and I'll say it again here, but as a pretty direct example, I can look at the design of Breath of the Wild and tell you that that only has very passing influence on games that exist as far as open world games. The main devs who designed the world and designed where everything is and what's in it, they took a cursory glance at the genre and were like, okay, yeah, we can do that too. They did not innovate in the ways that Nintendo typically innovates on a genre or a concept. Breath of the Wild is already a three-year-old game. It's starting to look really old already because we have games like Horizon Zero Dawn and every new Assassin's Creed game and Ghost of Tsushima, which I will say right now is better than Breath of the Wild by a long shot. Especially, and I, I believe that coming from you. <laughs> especially in terms of pure immersion content versus experience and the breaking of the mold of what open world games do. Ghost of Tsushima pushes that envelope as much as they possibly can without breaking it. It's still an open world game, but it, it gets very, 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 very close to not being that anymore, to being not trapped in the collection everything and checklist this and checklist that. The fact that Breath of the Wild has a menu that you open up and it tells you what your quests are and gives you a marker and you climb towers does not propel it past the genre. It grabs the genre by the heels and starts fucking it. <laughs> it's the same thing. It's not better. Yeah. Ironic how uh, open world games became trapped, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I, I just realized a good comparison for Nintendo. They're like an artist that refuses to use references. <laughs> Yeah. They're stagnated exactly like that. They don't want to, for whatever reason, look at any other online service or anything else that anyone is doing to innovate outside of maybe like a quick glance. And I don't know if maybe that's just because they don't want to feel like they're copying. They want to feel like they're doing their own thing. Probably that does sound like a Nintendo thing, but God, that really stagnates after a while. <laughs> I think it's the exact reason why we have huge successes like the Wii and huge problems like the Wii U, because Nintendo's success is almost entirely based on pure fucking random chance at this point. They have so many blunders as far as game reveals in the past, I don't know, five, ten years. They're just underwhelming, nobody's getting the things that they really want. How long has it been since we saw a good Metroid title? We got Splatoon 2, which is great. ARMS was hit or miss as far as giving a concept that is unique to people and also giving something that is fun and engaging for everybody. You weren't able to achieve that, even though that's exactly what the market was. And I'm not speaking to the pure sales numbers of Nintendo properties, because obviously game sales in Japan are so absolutely skewed towards Nintendo. It's not even <laughs> funny. I was having a conversation with somebody the other day about how Monster Hunter World sold so well in Japan compared to everywhere else. And the only other games on the top 10 sellers list of that year were Nintendo Properties and Black Ops 4. I guess Japan's just really getting on that Call of Duty train. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> but the point remains, brand loyalty is always going to be there. But I look at stuff like the Switch and look at 
the Joy-Cons and I look at the dock and I go, y'all are just becoming Apple. This is an inferior product as far as hardware with unneeded features that nobody asked for with proprietary hardware that you can only get from Nintendo over in price, uh, over inflated in price <laughs> <laughs> that people are starting to scalp on the internet for. Yeah. Nintendo tax is fucking garbage. I'm sick of that. I, I bought a Switch, and now if I want to buy any games... What what was the Platinum one? Astral Chain? Astral Chain. I really want that. It's been my, more than a year, I think? Something like that. I'm not going to get it for less than 60 bucks unless I get it from, like, used somewhere. Yeah, I think the big problem with used game stores now not becoming a thing, especially in the vein of, say, GameStop. Now, I hate GameStop for other reasons, but it was still one of the best places to go buy a Nintendo game because you knew at some point someone returned their Nintendo title or used their Nintendo title and it was $20 off at GameStop Yeah, less than two weeks later and you don't have to buy example again Breath of the Wild in 2020 oh, for $60 that's fucking ridiculous Jesus Christ you're right it is probably exactly that <laughs> oh but we ripped the shit out of Nintendo a little bit uh, to take a slight detour. I do feel bad, especially for Sakurai, <laughs> but for a lot of people at Nintendo for having to deal with Nintendo fans. <laughs> oh, yes. Let's... <laughs> Let's take a detour and talk about Nintendo fans. <laughs> I... There are some of them I feel bad for, like F-Zero fans. I haven't seen a ton of those being the rabid Mother 3 type ones, and they're never gonna get what they want. <laughs> Yeah, they're, yeah. They're, they're just that kid at the back of the room. It's like, I would like maybe something, and they never get it, and no one heard them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but Mother 3 fans are like the step below Smash fans. And Smash fans, oh, God. <laughs> yeah, look, you can say you want a very extremely specific thing from a developer, and, and this goes back to Nintendo doesn't really pay attention to anybody else. There's kind of almost a legitimate reason for that, and that's because a lot of the fan base doesn't understand development, doesn't understand video game design, doesn't understand how much time and effort goes into each and every individual decision. So when you have people saying stuff like, I don't know, every single Pokemon game should have every single Pokemon in it, which I have said. I have to. You also have to look at how much of a toll that is on development. And when you start getting demands like that from every single freaking direction, it's hard to understand what people actually want, what would actually be good, and what is just a fan or a loud group of fans saying they want one particular feature that wouldn't improve the series. I can say this though, in the example of Mario, like Paper Mario, the developers specifically don't give us an RPG system because they think RPG bad. But when the first two games did so well, you know, Paper Mario and the Thousand Year Door and whatever, what is it, Legend of the Sacred Stars? I don't remember what that I, game's called. Yeah, I don't remember outside of Thousand Year Door. Point is, when people are collectively saying, just give us RPG elements back, and then in Origami King, you give them puzzle-based combat, that's not what they want. And when you could just be like, okay, Here's a different Mario game, and it has puzzle-based combat. You could just do that. It doesn't have to be Paper Mario. Paper Mario, to a lot of people, is an RPG. Yeah. Us tickling the taint of game development lately has got me thinking about things from the perspective of a game developer, obviously. Like, no shit. Yeah. But um, another thing that got me thinking about, you know, that mindset, and we can't, we cannot go on a tangent because it will be the rest of this entire podcast. Final Fantasy VII Remake has got me thinking about, like, a lot of things 
from a lot of different perspectives. Like yours specifically, I feel like that's 100% valid. But I've started to think the people who are like, give us... What's the Crash Bandicoot remake called again? Pretty much the the remake of the trilogy. Don't the, call the it that. The Insane Trilogy. Yeah, the thing. Insane Trilogy. That's it. A lot of people played some of that and got bored with it really quick. And then a lot of people felt like it didn't feel right because a lot of the controls didn't transfer right to that whole upgrade. And when you think about it that way, that's people who like the original so much they're like give me that again but prettier if <laughs> i don't know how the hell they got anyone over at square to make final fantasy 7 remake because if i had been tetsu Nomura drawing cloud for the past 15 years and they're like okay give me that again the full thing i would say fuck you no <laughs> <laughs> i would too probably yeah I do not think if I had made Final Fantasy VII, I've had worked on Final Fantasy VII that however many years ago, like, God, fuck it, 20 something. And then I had worked on Final Fantasies every goddamn year since then. And someone was like, make that one again. I don't think I would want to. <laughs> yeah, definitely not. So I do, I do get it from a developer and an artist standpoint. You want to make new things, but also you shouldn't take the dead body of something that you made and be like, here's a new thing. Yeah. <laughs> and that's exactly what Nintendo does all the fucking time. And that's one of the reasons the fans are assholes. <laughs> it's kind of birthed by that treatment. Yeah. It's a bit back and forth for sure. I don't think that every single Nintendo fan complaint is uh, invalid, but I think the sheer rabidness of it all is fucking wild. I think Byleth was the most recent Smash character I revealed. And, you know, I wasn't happy about that one either because I had dumb expectations at the same time, but I wasn't like foaming at the mouth on Twitter because Sakurai made a decision I didn't like. <laughs> I think all Smash complaints, as far as character reveals, are completely invalid at this point. Yeah. Because we got shit like Cloud and Sonic the Hedgehog yeah. and Solid Snake. I think the fact that they got him back at all is kind of like, they did a lot of work. We got Bayonetta. There's all sorts of characters. Mr. Game & Watch. I know that's a Nintendo thing, but that's like, nobody asked for that, but it's great. There's so much in Smash as far as playable characters that you, no matter what you ask for, no, I don't care. <laughs> and if I were Sakura, I'd be like, no, I gave you everything. I'm going to do what I want now. Through the development of Smash 4 to now, I was a little upset at Sakurai at first. I was a little salty because throughout Smash 4 development, he definitely seemed to take a competitiveness is stupid kind of <laughs> mentality. And I don't think that, you know, everything needs to be competitive, but you can't deny, especially since Melee, that it is an aspect that a chunk of the fandom enjoys. And I don't think that's something to be invalidated. But at the same time, I also think you got to look at it from both perspectives. And that's when I started being like, okay, well, Sakurai is actually doing some pretty good stuff here. And then from there, I started feeling bad for him. Yeah, I think when you look at certain breakout examples like Bayonetta's balance, uh, you can point to that and be like, hey, look, this is a problem. You need to fix just this. And if it's a huge glaring issue on the competitive end, fix it. If you don't want to focus on the competitive side, don't let the competitive scene figure it out for themselves. That's perfectly fine. Yeah. But saying that you don't give a shit about those players at all, not only does is that just kind of a shitty stance to take, but that also just seems like anti-Nintendo in and of itself. Like you're saying, no, you can't have fun the way that you want to have fun. I wouldn't be surprised at that point if that had been post-Brawl Sakurai really angry about, oh God, I imagine he got quite a few death threats over tripping in Brawl. I, I'm not sure. I, I, I don't want to like say that's for sure, like what it is or anything, but I can see why at one point or at any point he might've been a bit salty. Yeah. I'm amazed that he at least is not publicly salty still because this man has built up a lot of problems for himself just by doing what he does so well. <laughs> yeah. 
I can't argue with that. I also feel like there is a certain point where you have to go, okay, look, the fans are fucking crazy. I am going to do whatever I want. Yeah. And if you make a mistake here or there, that's perfectly fine. I'm not saying that Sakurai to this day is still in the wrong for how he treats the fans of Smash. I think that he has honestly ascended above and beyond the call <laughs> of what he should and needs to be doing. Yeah. <laughs> I completely respect both his work ethic and his creativity at this point. Man's gotta have himself real isolated or he just does not care because... Ugh, every single goddamn Smash announcement or half the things just Nintendo Direct related. You get a good chunk of Twitter throwing up because they didn't see a Smash announcement. <laughs> yeah, as much as we are going to rip the shit out of Nintendo today, I think that the current state of Super Smash Bros. is perfect. If, if you add more characters or whatever or what have you, Fine, do it. But I also think that if there are any fans out there complaining that Smash is not enough in any way, just fucking take a break from Smash. Play something else. Yeah. Because Smash is fucking excellent in its current state. If any fighting game developer were doing as much for Smash as Nintendo is doing for Smash, it would be also talked about with absurd amounts of reverence. I think Smash players are extremely spoiled and think they can get away with whatever they say. If you look at like the top fighting games that are not Smash, like Tekken and Street Fighter, even they do not even remotely touch Smash. And I mean, a lot of that is the general appeal, but at the same time, a lot of that is just, it's pretty damn good. I think competitively, this is the one that like, you got nothing to complain about. All it's The balance is damn good compared to like any other <laughs> Smash. Yeah, something I've noticed recently is that Smash is not taken seriously really in a competitive fighting game perspective. And I think earlier this year or last year, I saw an independent uh, Smash tournament pop up with a $10,000 first prize. And it was completely over the internet. Yeah, yeah, it was this year. Because it was it was in spite of the whole. Oh yeah, yeah. It was a. Uh, it's critical. I critical, think. yeah. Yeah, uh, critical and his crew did that, and I think that is fucking awesome of all of those people to get together and do that. That's really cool to see at like official Evo the prize, the first prize for Smash is like I don't know a sixty dollar controller or something like that. <laughs> yeah, that's sad. That's pathetic. Oh. That's, I don't even want to show up. Yeah. No one's going to want to watch that. Yeah. No one's going to want to watch the people who are excited to show up to fight for a controller. If I had gone to Evo to play Smash without even thinking about any prizes and then saw that the prize was like, here's a GameStop controller, I probably would have been like, I don't know if I want to anymore. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I think a huge amount of thunder would be sucked out of your sails. Yeah. Last Smash thing, possibly, but I did want to point this out because I know you and I have talked about Smash as a party game versus Smash as a fighter, the competitiveness and all that. I think it was last night I was actually thinking about it, and I realized a good comparison between Smash and other fighting games, quote unquote, is... While other fighting games have really refined, easy to understand movement, they have complex fighting mechanics. The moves, the combos, that's the stuff you have to learn. You don't have to learn movement other than double tap forward to dash. Back goes back. Sometimes it blocks. Down ducks, up jumps. <laughs> right. Smash has easy as fuck attacks. You know, side B up B, your smash attacks. All that's really easy to understand. The movement is the stupidly difficult part for me, at least. <laughs> yeah, I can agree with that. The movement's the hard part. It's the positioning, but both of them still have the mind games, the footsies, the spice of fighting games. If I go online and play Smash with a character I know, I'll be bad at it. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll have some games that have that fighting game spice. That I'll run into that one person that is as bad as I am, but slightly better, and I'll almost beat them and they'll feel fucking good. <laughs> yeah, honestly, the difference between competitive Smash and party fun with your friends Smash, sometimes it's as little as as turning certain items off. And that's beautiful. The fact that Smash 
can be as casual or as hardcore as you want, but it fits the whole spectrum of an audience. We talked, I think literally in the last episode, about how fighting games have like a hard barrier of entry. Yeah. And I think that Smash not being taken seriously because it has such a low barrier of entry is sad because it's a, it's a really good example of a high skill ceiling. Yeah, I think anything that has attacks in it and movement and you can fight against another player is technically a fighting game depending on who's playing it. Because if it's super casual, people just mashing buttons, then they're probably just playing it like a party game, and that's fine. You get out of the experience what you want to put into it. But if someone is sitting there like, okay, this is the range of this attack, I can move this far and do this, blah, blah, blah. They are memorizing how they do things as a character and fighting against someone else who's doing that. That's fucking competitive as hell. There's sparks there. <laughs> yeah, among the same token, you can even say like 1v1 Dark Souls is competitive fighting game. Yeah, that's definitely something I could, I mean, I've seen people playing mind games in that and opening people up as they dodge back and then going forward and attacking. That is like just punishing a move. <laughs> Yes, exactly. Uh, so as far as what is a fighting game or what is the barrier of entry, Smash covers it. I'd say so, for sure. Yeah, I think not taking it seriously is... That's just salty fighting game players. And I mean, that's just fighting game players. <laughs> yeah, moving on. Yes, Nintendo. Shit, what else do I not like? <laughs> I, as a kid, loved to think that I had a dog in the fight between Nintendo and Sega when I really became a Sonic fan when I played Sonic Adventure 2 Battle on the GameCube. <laughs> that fight had ended. <laughs> I think that was an interesting point in history that I have zero memory of as a born in 93 millennial. I, yeah, I think it's funny because... <laughs> Born in 94, one of my favorite game consoles ever was a Sega Saturn, and by that point, Sega had already crashed and burned and <laughs> left the console market, and I was like, man, Sega Saturn's so much better than a PlayStation. <laughs> <laughs> and no one's even having that conversation at the time. Oh, uh, I feel that, because that's exactly how I was fucking playing Sonic Adventure 2 Battle, was, oh yeah, Sega's better than Nintendo, as if they weren't sucking Nintendo's toes to be a third party developer at the time <laughs> yeah god damn oh <sighs> if we talk about heyday nintendo i really do want to talk about how like i think the gamecube was probably one of the strongest things that nintendo ever had yes i think absolutely the only thing that really killed it was the lack of third party support <sighs> Was there like a weird development problem with it as far as developer kits? Because it wasn't the gimmicks that stopped people that time. And I can see why Nintendo would kind of be like, okay, well, if no one's going to develop for us anyway, we're going to make a weird little funky Wiimote. <laughs> okay, so background information. If you wanted to publish a video game on a PlayStation or uh, like a PlayStation 2 or an Xbox or a GameCube at the time, you needed to get licensed licensing permission directly from a company. Well, you still do today. And in order to do that back in the day, for PlayStation, it was as simple as you buy a dev kit, you now have publishing permission, basically. Oh, yeah. Um, which meant that it was super easy to get into the game, but you had to develop a game on the console. And when the game was done, Sony then had to look at it and be like, okay, yeah, it's a game, it works, it's playable. Submit it to the ESRB, then it gets published. And that's how the PS2 library happened. <laughs> and that's how the PS2 has like 4,000 video games. To release a game on the Xbox, it was pretty similar, but not the same. Xbox had a little bit more of a hands-on approach. So they wanted to watch development as it happened. And Nintendo was even more hands-on than them. They wanted to own the development of that title as it was being made. Ah, uh, yeah, that one isn't the same thing as no one will make a game for our gimmick system. It's no one will make a game for us because we want it. <laughs> it kind of echoes how Nintendo works today in that they don't really technically have one studio that is quote unquote, Nintendo Studios developed. Yeah. They have a whole <clears throat> bunch of third party developers that they bought. And now those developers have 
no choice <laughs> but to work on Nintendo properties. Uh, and if they have ideas outside of those properties, they end up being owned by Nintendo. So anything like HAL Laboratories, I won't use Game Freak as an example because technically they own one third of the Pokemon company and they aren't technically Nintendo. But a lot of those developers, like the ones who worked on Pikmin or the ones who worked on Breath of the Wild in small part, there's a lot of studios that don't get to have any sort of autonomy. But when you're working for, say, Microsoft, like all the studios that Microsoft bought that are now technically first party, those studios still technically have permission to make things on their own, just not with Microsoft's budget. And proving that you didn't do that on Microsoft's budget would be insanely hard, and it would be its own legal battle or whatever. But when you have stuff like for Sony, you can just be like, hey, I bought a dev kit three years ago. Me and my friends churned out this game. We think it's pretty good. And Sony goes, all right, you're a first party exclusive developer now. <laughs> And we're going to fund you and back you and oversee this. And that's exactly what happened with, say, No Man's Sky. And they aren't permanently tied to PlayStation in that way. PlayStation just has the rights to that particular property and oversees that particular property. Because at some point, PlayStation decided hands-off development was the best way to see creativity from developers. And I 100% agree with that opinion. Yeah. There's no such thing as a good company, no ethical consumption under capitalism, all this. We, we know all that. But uh, Sony, as far as the big three, they seem like the easiest to work with. <laughs> They really do. You'd think that Nintendo would be easier to work with, but they have a legacy to protect. They can't just let you make a game for them. That's not how it would work. It would be a little bit like trying to work for the mob. <laughs> you get pulled into a car in the middle of a dark alleyway and you're like, uh, so do I work for you guys now? <laughs> I think Sega must have had to nail a really good deal with Nintendo then for the GameCube because at some point they started moving everything else to the Xbox and PS2 also. So I don't know what they did to... If I were a betting man, I would say that Nintendo was so happy to have won the battle between them and Sega that they were like, yeah, you can keep your properties. We just want to step on <laughs> We don't on want them. You. We just want to <laughs> step on you a little bit. Oh. <laughs> I do love the GameCube, though. Everything that did come out on it, as far as major releases, I can't think of anything that, like, flopped. <laughs> yeah, I fucking love Luigi's Mansion. I love Mario Sunshine. Oh, yeah. I love Twilight Princess. Don't hit me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I love Wind Waker. The furry podcast approves of Twilight Princess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, big surprise. <laughs> Twilight Princess is my favorite Legend of Zelda game. Oops. Says I think the wolf persona. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But honestly, the wolf parts of the game aren't even my favorite parts of the game. Yeah. My favorite parts of Twilight Princess. This is supposed to be shitting on Nintendo, but <laughs> <laughs> my favorite parts of Twilight Princess are the character development moments that happen with side characters with characters in the world that are not Link, are not Princess Zelda, but everyone else who has to deal with the ramifications of what the realm is going through. You have to deal with characters who lose people, who die. You have to deal with characters who are separated from their families and think they're gonna die. You have to deal with abandoned villages that don't have any people left anymore. You have to deal with people isolating themselves because they live in constant fear. And you see this pop up in an extremely good way that is only alluded to in almost every other Legend of Zelda game. Or it was a legend or... Our people used to do this because... Twilight Princess, you're right there in it as it's happening. There's a group of characters in Twilight Princess that exists specifically as a resistance group. Yeah, they really did take, like, the ideas for world building that uh, Ocarina of Time had and 
crank it up to 11. Because I think Ocarina of Time, for its time, definitely had the best Legend of Zelda world building. It also kind of helped that it had the best Legend of Zelda world so far at that time. Absolutely. But Twilight Princess fleshes that shit out. Yeah, I think Twilight Princess does such a damn good job of fleshing out its world building and its characters compared to every other game. People will complain about the Twilight Princess intro because it's kind of long. And I don't care because I love those characters. I love seeing them interact. I love seeing them have emotions. I love seeing the village that Link grew up in have character and development. In Ocarina of Time, there's like one or two lines that establish the character of the people who live there. You know that Mido's an angry fuck that doesn't let Link do anything. Saria likes Link. You know there's a bunch of Kokiri that are just fuckheads because they're basically children forever and that's it there's there's no depth there to speak of yeah i I think as far as game openings that people complain about a lot twilight princess is not nearly as dry as like skyrim (laughs) or anything yes fucking skyrim i don't think i see anyone do any sort of the the only time i see someone play skyrim anymore is with some stupid mod or vr that they're just fucking around with and every time it's oh this opening again (laughs) so much so that it became a meme yeah i think it's really interesting that we set out to rip Nintendo a new one, and we ended up, you know, gushing a little bit. And I think that's part of, like, part of the beef is they don't stop giving us good things, but the things that are wrong, they don't acknowledge at all. (laughs) Yeah, because earlier I said that I think that Breath of the Wild is going to be the worst aging Legend of Zelda game probably ever. Maybe Skyward Sword people might say age is worse but i haven't played that one it's the only mainline one i haven't played the reason why i say that is because i love the things that made zelda zelda at its core i loved the long labyrinthian dungeons where sometimes you get lost because you don't know where a key is i like that i like that it's formulaic you go in the dungeon you find the key you get the item you fight the mini boss you fight the boss i like that so to take that out of breath of the wild I don't like seeing it. Do I think that that immediately ruins the entire game? Hell no. Of course I don't. I think there's a lot of value in Breath of the Wild. There's a lot of Legend of Zelda also taken out of it. And I don't mean that to sound like there's no value in Legend of Zelda. (laughs) But um, there could have been a bigger middle ground between it's still got these quality thought out dungeons and it's still got a big vast expansive world i think if the breath of the wild world had because it still has some pretty good world building but it's not twilight princess world building if it had some more world building in there some more you know unique world as far as dungeons go because they almost had it all the beast things if they just didn't look the same (laughs) Uh, Okay, here's where I get into, as a game developer, I would have done this. I also have to say, as a writer, the cardinal sin of anything you write is do not tell the least interesting part of the story. Tell the most interesting part of the story. So when in Breath of the Wild, you get all of these little videos about what happened a hundred years ago and you don't play that part of his life, that to me is one of the worst design decisions you possibly could have done. Putting him in the game a hundred years later when the world doesn't have people in it and it's post-apocalyptic, everything seems like there is no hope anymore. You've taken all of the tension and all of the potential character development and all of that out of the scenario that the player experiences and you've put it in the that already happened sorry you don't get to play it you don't get to play the fall of hyrule kingdom and that is the worst part of breath of the wild i think you're 100 percent right on that because the dual world aspect of a lot of legend of zelda games would have worked really well as the past and then the waking up part if you just kind of streamlined the waking up part more towards okay go fight ganon because i can see why you know making the past part nearly as fleshed out as it looked in these brief glimpses you get and then keeping the same fleshed out quote unquote future which for what it would have been if they had fleshed out the past what we got for the future is definitely more fleshed out but i think 
it still would have been better to get a more fleshed out past that you play rather than a half decently fleshed out post-apocalyptic world where everything has already happened. Yeah, I, Breath of the Wild does this thing with the whole concept where it's like, discover Hyrule. And it's like, okay, for one, Link already lived there his whole fucking life. You would know some of it. I hate when video games are like, here, play this adult character who has lived in this space their whole life and they don't know it suddenly. <laughs> that, look, Amnesia, I get that. I get that whole aspect. I get it. It's tired. I'm done with it. Throw it out. <laughs> <laughs> discover the story discover your past and then fight for the future is such a it's such an overdone trope but also in breath of the wild it's done in a way that is particularly distracting and bad for the overarching feel of it it doesn't come across as the right time yeah i feel that oh god what were we talking about before we got on the breath of the wild thing because i had a point and i completely forgot it <laughs> i don't know uh this is how all of these podcasts are gonna go i hope you guys are getting used to it by now <laughs> episode yeah. two get used to it uh, we're 55 minutes in uh on my timer which is gonna be cut down quite significantly yeah and I've mentioned Breath of the Wild and gone on several rants several times now. You say something. What's your favorite Nintendo property? Shit. Do I have way more eggs in this basket than you do? <laughs> I think I just don't like the online service. <laughs> I'm trying to think. I, I actually, the very first game I ever played was Super Mario Brothers Deluxe on the Game Boy Color. So I started out in that ballpark and then i got luigi's mansion on the gamecube and like any half of the 90s kid and more than half the 90s kids i was obsessed with pokemon i'd say a majority of 90s kids that was a wild ass phenomenon i think pokemon might be one of my favorites if i'm being honest it's difficult i i, I like have such a spotty history with nintendo where i have played a lot but not a lot of it sunk in I think part of that is because Nintendo has always done things pretty inoffensively and not stupidly as far as, you know, keeping a clean look upon themselves. And <laughs> I've been realizing even more lately that I have such a love for stupid, broken, dumb, stupid stuff. Because, <laughs> like, I started out with Sonic. Not started out, but, you know, as soon as I found Sonic, Mario who... <laughs> <laughs> I think it says a lot about me as a person, but Sonic Adventure 2, and I gotta stop, I'm gonna, am I gonna bring this up every podcast? That I, I played a lot of Sonic Adventure 2 as a kid, <laughs> <laughs> but I think that feel comes across pretty well for just my general taste is, boy, that sure is stupid, but fun. <laughs> So what you're saying is you haven't actually played a whole lot of Nintendo games. I've played a lot of Nintendo games, but just not a lot of them stick. So far much that whenever I think about my favorite Nintendo title, I can't pick one because they all just come up in my brain as, that was a fun experience. <laughs> it didn't stick. It didn't click. Yeah, I guess I can get that. The first game, by contrast, the first game that I ever played was the original Legend of Zelda when I was like three or four years old. I barely remember it. I know I didn't finish it yeah. at the time. I did later. So by comparison, Nintendo was built into my blood. The first console I had was Nintendo Entertainment System, and I had all sorts of games for it that I don't remember now. Uh, I remember playing the crap out of Duck Hunt. I remember going over to my friend's house and he had a Super Nintendo. And I was like, whoa, you linked to the past. This is the best thing ever. And it probably still is. <laughs> and I just, I, re I remember so much of my childhood is built around that NES and a stupid, tiny, CRT television in my room. You know, I did just remember my favorite Nintendo property and I wish I hadn't because this with your love of Twilight Princess is going to look so fucking basic bitch furry, but I fucking <laughs> love Star Fox. <laughs> I started with Assault. <laughs> but oh no I went back through. oh no me too <laughs> oh no <laughs> the most sonic adventure 2 of the star fox oh series. no <laughs> i'm exactly the same <laughs> oh no I, I like the world 
quote unquote, because it's not like there's much building in the world, but just this general go fucking fly and shoot things. That's yeah. fun. I do love Star Fox. I've always felt so distant from Nintendo because uh, my brother was big into like Legend of Zelda like you are. And I always just like felt like I was looking from a distance. Like, yeah, I get it. It's fun. I don't vibe with it nearly on the same level. So let's talk more about current Nintendo games and trends and stuff. Because as far as the whole history of Nintendo, we both agree like the GameCube was the best step. And I think stuff that made the Wii good was also stuff that made the GameCube good. And the stuff that made the Wii U good or the Wii U bad was stuff that made the Wii bad. And then that sort of carried over and then they just sort of like lost all sense of competitiveness the second the Wii was a success. Yeah. So now that the Switch exists and they've combined both their handheld and their home console markets, looking at like the 3DS and, you know, how they're transitioning out of that, do you think they've done a good job? As far as abandoning the 3DS, yes. (laughs) (laughs) As far as portability, I haven't taken that Switch out the dock, at least not since our Joy-Con started getting drift. Because I know I could take that apart and fix it. Or I could send it to Nintendo to get it fixed for free. I don't wanna. (laughs) Yeah. Going through the hassle just... (sighs) The fact that there is a hassle to begin with. I've I've never been a fan of handheld games. Because I've always felt they were kind of lesser. I've always been a kind of a console gamer. So uh, (laughs) I was kind of the person while everyone else is like, PC is better than console. I'm like, console is better than handheld. (laughs) (laughs) And I was the kid with the PSP. (laughs) (laughs) So, you know, I had a Game Boy. I had a Game Boy Advance. And I did love certain games on them. I played the shit out of Link's Awakening because you know I did. Yeah. But can I say that I really played anything else on my Game Boy Color or anything else on my Game Boy Advanced SP? Nothing I remember. Nothing worth remembering. Yeah. The best games that were ever on portable systems, they took advantage of the fact that it was portable. Pokemon pretty much made that a gimmick as in like, go trade with people, go do this, have this adventure with the millions of children that you probably know that are also playing this game. (laughs) The portability of it was an aspect. And then you go to like the DS, and one of the things that immediately comes to memory is The World Ends With You. I didn't really touch on it as much as I'd like to last time, so this is a good segue. The way that the stylus, the combat on that felt so clean and so good. And then the microphone for like blowing into it for certain moves was good. And then you had, it took advantage of both screens even. You had one side of combat on top one on the bottom that is a perfect example of we're gonna use it all (laughs) yes but as far as modern day nintendo when was the last time you detached a joy con to use it for something (laughs) when's the last time hd rumble made a game interesting yeah when during the wii u's life cycle was that really ever utilized properly in a video game i think that nintendo does make way for interesting game experiences as far as making hardware that's fucking bonkers and say no. I don't think that the gimmick of that actually really has a whole lot of value. I th- sure, it's interesting, it's a selling point, but I don't think it really makes a game better. I think the, the games that people make are what's good. Yeah, I think them banking on developers using their gimmicks to make really interesting experiences. That's ballsy, I gotta say. If you're making an entire console around an idea and you don't immediately have an entire library of games that will make the making of this console worth it, then why not just make a regular console? (laughs) Yeah, I, I do think the Switch is an idea of something that is powerful enough to be handheld or in the living room is good. I don't think that the idea of, okay, there's a high power mode and a low power mode, and the dock functions as no additional, like, RAM or processing power or anything like that, is ridiculous when a dock is like 100 bucks. It needs to do a little bit more more than just supply power to my switch yeah 
glorified HDMI cable. <laughs> really? Yes. When you have games that performance-wise are really shit on the Switch, don't tell me that you think playing Witcher 3 on the Switch is the best way to play that game. Oh, that's gotta be... I mean, I, I've heard things about it being good for what it is. <laughs> that's the nicest way I think anyone can put it. <laughs> Look, okay, Skyrim, right, came out, what, six years before the Switch did, I think? If not more, I can't even remember. Six six or seven. Uh, I think it's six, because I think it's 11, 11, 11 Skyrim came out. Oh, okay. And then I think it's like, what, late 2016? Yeah, somewhere around there. I, I don't remember. So five, five or six years. And then uh, Skyrim doesn't run at max settings on a Switch. Sad. Not even docked. Very sad. <laughs> so... Why would you play? Yeah, I, it's not even the argument of like, well, a PS3 wasn't the best way to play Skyrim at the time graphically. Like, yes, of course, I know that. My save file for PS3 for Skyrim was so large it would no longer load into the RAM. I get it. <laughs> so, you know, the hardware limitations exist. I get that. But the PS3 wasn't playing a six year old game, though. <laughs> the, yeah, the six the PS3 was not playing a six year old game. The Switch is playing a game that is now so old and has been ported to so many things that people make a joke about it being ported to shit. And when you have a major release like The Witcher that looks great on every other console and it looks like absolute trash hole on the Switch, when you have your flagship games, like, I hate to go back to the Breath of Wild example, running at like 20 to 10 FPS in some places on the Switch, your hardware is not good. You needed to charge more money and you needed to make a better, more lasting console because the Switch, the second the PS5 is out and the Series X is out, the Switch is gonna look like dog shit. It's gonna look like it's only ever been a handheld console. Yeah, Ugh. You're, you're right. I haven't thought about that. The best looking games on the system are the ones that use tricks to make the games look better rather than the ones that can just look good. And I think there's some value there, but that's only because it's specific teams that made it specifically for the Switch. You cannot port a game that just looks good on any other console to the Switch and it look good unless you're gonna sit there and take the time to clean up your port enough to where it specifically looks good on the switch and no one's gonna do that i will like to take the example of bloodstained because bloodstained is a game that is not that graphically intensive is not that graphically impressive but doesn't run well on the switch runs just fine on everything else why doesn't it run well on the Switch? And the devs themselves have said that there's just, there's there's some sort of problem with the Switch from a developer's perspective that makes it hard to optimize for. And obviously I don't, I've never developed a game for the Switch, so I don't know what this is, but for that to exist, it seems to even be affecting Nintendo's first party stuff. And for it to be that glaringly obvious, it's like, why did you release the Switch as early as you did? Did you just want to not make any more 3DS games? Was the Wii U failing that hard? Oh, Were you that desperate? I bet, they, I bet they were sweating after the Wii U. Is the problem now that you have a rushed inferior product that you really can't fix too much or you're propelling it into the next, you know, era. So then you have to make a console that because the, the era would be too short, you have to make a, a, a new thing that supports all Switch titles, competes with the next generation, and is still a portable device. So if you told me in a year or two there was a Switch 2.0 or a Switch XL or whatever the fuck they would want to call it that was just better, I would believe you that they were going to do that. But the fact that they have to and the fact that so many of their games are still selling as well as they do on such a shit piece of hardware really makes you wonder why they would even need to. Why bother? Yeah. Why do it? I would really like to see them take innovation in a different direction, where instead of innovating because we have the money to and we have experiments we'd like to try, for a company that takes fun into consideration so heavily, they really don't try to look at 
what other people consider fun. Yeah. And the fact that they still get it half the time, I think, is just they're really good at playing darts or something, I guess. I, I think it has more to do with the money. I think that they have so much godforsaken money off of how little these titles probably take to make because there's no way that simple titles like what nintendo makes like like origami king you know some team of writers got paid buku money to write as good as the writing is in that game and somebody sat around at a desk with a bunch of like puzzle disc things and like you know they made like a little paper craft of that and you know someone spent a shitload of time studying origami for all of the different toads or whatever but everything else about the development of that game from a pure programming standpoint is so easy yeah there's you could probably hire like 10 people to program for some of these nintendo games i i don't want to see them exactly go in the direction of conforming because they need to fix some of their issues. I like to see them fix some of their issues and keep some of that spice at the same time. Maybe consider, you know, more than just fun and consider, like, how does this feel to navigate as a system? How does this feel to operate as a system? That is that is something that is definitely valuable, and I think that's something that PlayStation and Xbox have been considering, at least on a minor level. I think they consider it on a pretty major level. Yeah. At, at, at the very least, they're definitely doing it more than Nintendo is, because even the 360, they that big update that ditched the old funky-looking uh, UI and then it incorporated avatars or whatever, because that was the quirk at the time. That was clean, and that completely influenced Microsoft's UI for everything since then. In fact, that <laughs> I'm pretty sure that inspired Windows 8. <laughs> yes, yes, it did. So to look at that example and just not take heed of it is something Nintendo does very well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to to not even care that other people have passed you is something so, so Nintendo. But what, what I don't understand is that even in Sony's department, they're still willing to innovate in specific directions. PlayStation VR. That's cool. The fact that you can have any sort of VR on a console is cool. Yeah. Nintendo did try to bank on that a little bit with Labo. They were like, <laughs> oh, people want virtual reality, <laughs> do they? Oh, this is what the kids want these days? <laughs> Here's some cardboard. Yeah, here, go play with some boxes, chump. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus fucking Christ, Labo was a fucking... <sighs> I think at least the presentation was cute for Labo, but it really was an $80 box of cardboard. Look, if you bought Labo, I'm sorry. You probably have it sitting somewhere in your house with like bent corners and shit, and you're never getting that money back. I really hope, and I kind of don't want to know, if Labo is still full price. <laughs> <laughs> oh god I, why did you have to say that it, it definitely is oh. you know it is here's this two year old box of nintendo cardboard for 80 bucks <laughs> fuck that man what I was getting at, Nintendo doesn't start from a healthy baseline to then innovate off of like everybody else should. Uh, they just sort of are like, our baseline is fucking crazy. And look, Nintendo, that's great. That's, that's nice, sweetie. <laughs> but put it away for a minute and let's make actual video games that are fun and interesting to play and don't have huge fucking glaring problems as far as ignoring your fan base. I think for once in my life, I understand where Nintendo is coming from because the idea of we're doing our own thing and as much as I don't like the idea of not comparing what everyone else is doing and trying to make something that feels good still or works properly still i at least can appreciate like we're going to try to do our own thing that is unique and fun and people are going to enjoy it where it falls flat is the absolute lack of support and the flare dies off real quick when no one's doing anything for it and your system is not being kept up with <laughs> yeah when you're falling behind in hardware specs and 
their third party games look like shit because your console doesn't support it. When your console is literally falling apart because you had to rush it out and make it quick to recoup costs on the Wii U. When you are making developer decisions for your first party games where you are not innovating, you are taking one step forward, two steps back, making people angry. <sighs> what are you doing? Why do all of these things to try to be fun and unique and special and wear a pretty little I'm special hat when it hasn't actually made you fun or unique or special? It's just made you annoying to deal with. I don't want to buy a Switch. I don't want to buy Switch games because they're going to give me a fucking headache. If Astral Chain was on a different system, I'd have it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Bayonetta 2 is on a different... On Steam, I own it already. You have no idea how much <laughs> I want to play Astral Chain and Bayonetta and just don't because I think Bayonetta is still 60 fucking dollars. Yeah, Bayonetta 1 and 2, the bundle, 60 bucks. And I think even on Wii U, we checked. Yeah, I don't know how long ago it was we checked. That's ridiculous i'm not gonna pay that yeah that's it's such an old game at this point i can go anywhere else and get a really good game for like twenty dollars oh there's a sale happening cool i just picked up sega's best-selling title and its sequel for 40 bucks on playstation yeah it really does be like that feels like there's no follow-through and that's what bugs me the most because the general idea of innovation is something that it sparks something in me i like i like new things i like people who are trying to do new experiences i do not want to discourage the idea of nintendo shooting for the stars if no one else is shooting for the same stars if they're going off the beaten path great please support it the full way through and please know that other people will also <laughs> yeah because otherwise it falls flat on its ass and you end up with a half supported system and 60 dollar games that are four years old <laughs> i know this was a, a hot button topic a couple years ago but i'm bringing it back up in splatoon open up your friends list with people added with usernames and just invite them to chat in a voice chat supported on the console with first party microphones and headsets and to play Splatoon. Why is that not a thing? Why was that never a thing? Why after years and years of complaining and people hating that it wasn't a thing, do you have to defend that, oh, there's a very good reason we don't do the bare minimum. It's to protect people from themselves. No, that's not your fucking responsibility. You know how many kids are gonna, like, put their Switch down and go fucking play Fortnite and yell at people? You know how many swears an average Gen Zer must hear in their life? Like, I don't think Nintendo's gonna do much by throwing friend codes out there. Yeah, when I played Halo 3 back in the day and every Xbox came with a microphone... Oh god, I remember that. You had 10-year-olds saying that they were gonna do terrible things to your mother's corpse when you weren't looking because you bonked them upside the head with a funny spike gun. I love that that sound effect specifically. <laughs> <laughs> so when children are exposed to video games that let them interact with other people everywhere else, you have not created a safe space for a parents to buy only a Nintendo system and then that's all little Timmy or Susie has to play. They're safe from the evils of the world. That's not what parents do in large part. You're probably actually protecting like 5% of kids because the other like 30% of kids who only own a Nintendo system probably have abusive parents, shitty friends, abusive school system, any other problem that exists in the world today. To make that Nintendo space their one safe haven from interacting with other people who could or could not be harmful is such a shitty, shitty, shitty excuse not to do it. I am the kind of person that won't play games online if people can interact with me because they can say mean thing to me. And even I do not like <laughs> all of the online stuff with Nintendo. That's saying something because I'm the kind of person that that would be ideal for. And I hate it. <laughs> My best friends 
the the people I am closest to in the world are people who exist in places that are not in my physical space. I have a friend from England who I've been talking to since I was 14. And, you know, he's a little bit older than me. Whatever. It, like, by two years, I think. And we've been talking for, like, 10 years. And that dude's one of my best friends. Jay, if you're listening to this, hi, dude. What's up? We should play something. I absolutely love connecting with people who are not near me. Some of my other best friends are friends I made through World of Warcraft. And I stopped playing WoW because WoW has its own problems, but we still connect and play video games on Discord to this day. We still communicate. And for Nintendo to not offer the same experience of meeting someone who could be your lifelong friend on an, in an online sphere, to not capture the same magic that is playing Link to the Past on your neighbor's Super Nintendo, that's so, that's such a wasted opportunity. Some of the issue is they're shooting for that innovation, but they're also trying to be a console. They're trying to give that experience without either intending to at the same time, kind of weirdly, or definitely not knowing how to, apparently. I think it definitely just needs to be a basis by basis moderation. The reason I don't like going online because people can be mean to me is because I played League of Legends and it traumatized me. <laughs> yeah. And you don't got a League of Legends on the Switch. I don't think people who play League of Legends are going to be like, okay, time to go grief someone in, uh, what's an online Switch? I don't even know what game people play online on the Switch. Yeah, I don't know. Splatoon either. 2? <laughs> <laughs> Do people still play Splatoon 2? I don't know. That's how, that's how little I use our switch yeah to compare a console's community even even in the worst of times it was not nearly as toxic as it has ever been on pc so if you take for example i i used rainbow six as my example for a game that has changed here's something else Rainbow Six on console has a much better, cleaner community than it does on PC. And the reasons for this is stuff like the people who are PC elitists are, I hate to say this, but in general, elitists about everything that they do. So when you come into a gaming sphere and... The people you're already playing with are elitists. They're going to grief your game. They're going to not cooperate with you. They're going to vote kick you just because they can. And, and all of this sort of thing. And you know there are cheaters. It takes away a huge amount of the experience. I don't think that playing online games on PC is the best experience because the community on PC has always been entitled and petty and willing to ruin other people's experiences because that's their experience. That's their fun. On console, it's much harder to ruin people's experiences just because you want to. It's still very much achievable and it still very much happens. And you still get people shouting expletives at you. You definitely do. But on a game by game basis, it's still better. And I think that the community that surrounds Nintendo products and the community that surrounds Nintendo IPs is generally a community that when I see them speak online, they are either really memey shitheads. <laughs> They're either really memey shitheads or they are elitists. And maybe. What Nintendo is really afraid of is people on Nintendo consoles speaking on a Nintendo space, saying something bad about a Nintendo property. Mommy, somebody called me a slur in Splatoon 2. <laughs> <laughs> Mommy, someone called me a slur because I said Pokemon was fun. <laughs> That's the Twitter experience. <laughs> <laughs> but Twitter is not Splatoon. Yeah. It's not. Just because you have a social experience doesn't mean it's going to turn toxic. I don't know why Nintendo would be afraid of, like, creating that basis-to-basis -basis moderation. If little Timmy gets called a slur, give little Timmy the tools to tell somebody about it. And then Nintendo, as ruthless as they are on this type of thing, will probably be willing to 
get rid of whoever's throwing around slurs in Splatoon 2. <laughs> Let people talk to each other and then open up a moderation service. And if you really want to be brutal about how you treat people, put in your terms of service, don't cuss, don't do this, don't do that, don't call people mean names. And if you do, someone can report you and you can get your communication rights revoked. And you know what? If that's what Nintendo wanted to do, fine, do it. I don't care. Just let people talk to each other. Yeah. The things that ended up traumatizing me, and I hate using that word, but it is kind of accurate <laughs> as far as online play goes. It wasn't like one bad game of League of Legends. It was a bad overall League of Legends experience. <laughs> and that's not something you're going to get on a Nintendo title, I would think, if it's being moderated. I don't think anyone is going to get traumatized by playing online on a Switch if Nintendo has people taking care of it. Fucking League of Legends moderation? What the hell do they do? <laughs> yeah, League of Legends, they don't care. It's, it's part of the experience at this point, I'd say. <laughs> yes. There are people who will say that tilting your opponent is a legitimate strategy. And if you are one of those people, I want you to know just because it works doesn't mean you're not a shitty person. Yes, just because you are allowed to do something does not mean somebody can't punch you for it. Yes, and even if it is a legitimate strategy, it doesn't make you fun to play with, interesting to be around, or, you know, a good person. I don't think they're too concerned about being good people. <laughs> yeah, definitely not. You know what? If you play League of Legends and you make people mad on purpose, you go on the internet and you make people mad on purpose. Fuck you. If you're listening to this podcast right now and you want to make me mad, fuck you. <laughs> just, just that comment. Your Honor, League of Legends. <laughs> Death! <laughs> I think that's a pretty good note to end it on. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what what do we got for next week? What's, what's uh... um? Did we come up with anything? Oh, difficulty in games. That's right. That'll be interesting. I'll have to think on that a bit. Um, one thing we discussed was if you guys, if there's any tangents we went on that we didn't quite cover in depth as much as you'd like, uh, feel free to leave a comment and ask us to maybe approach it again because I I understand. <laughs> yeah, we might eventually have to do a Q&A episode where we expound upon our opinion. Like if we touch on something and then we don't really elaborate. Oh yeah, if there's one thing I took away from episode one, it's that I really need to start elaborating on my opinions more because I kind of just say things sometimes. Yeah, and if in this episode I talk a little bit more than he does, let me know. I will shut up and let him talk more. I think, if anything, if that did happen, it's because, like you said, you had more of a stake in the Nintendo boat. I just don't like their online. <laughs> yeah, but I fucking talked a lot for the online part, too. <laughs> <laughs> <You're fine. laughs>